Okay folks, welcome back. Today is going to be our next 300 Winchester Magnum video. And this video is several weeks late. Occasionally this happens to me, like with a, with a video series or something. I get so many things going on. Like there's so many things going on that I need to cover in the next video that it feels like an overwhelming task. That's where I've been here over the last few weeks with 300 Winchester Magnum. I've got so much to talk about. Today's video might be a mess. It might be three hours long. I don't know, but I've got to get through this mental barrier so we can move on with this series. Now, two or three weeks ago, I actually filmed a 300 Winchester Magnum video. I even shot the rounds. The results were so poor that I just could not come up with the motivation to edit the video and release it. Like it was awful. Now, a lot of times with really bad results, we can use that as a learning opportunity. We can identify a bad, you know, powder and bullet combination or whatever, but this wasn't one of those. I had introduced so many new variables that I still don't know why the results of that range trip were so poor. So here at the beginning, let's talk about some of the things I tried to tackle in the last range trip and we'll kind of review the results a little bit before we move on to today. First of all, I put a new stock on the gun. I went with another Boyd's Pro Varmint just like the one I put on my 6.5 Creedmoor Thompson Center Compass. Same stock, I just went with the blaze orange color this time. I did run into one small problem. So I'll tell you what, let's go have a look at a segment that I filmed kind of showing off the stock and, and talking about one of the problems I ran into. So I'll wait here, you guys go uh, look at that. All right, folks, here's another look at our stock. And there are a couple things that I wanted to show you really quick that are different from my experience with the 6.5 uh, Creedmoor version. When I put this guide together, it didn't look like I had a lot of clearance between the barrel and the stock. So I pulled out the old dollar bill and did the dollar bill test where you, you, know, you slide it down, make sure that all the way back to your receiver, there's no interference, no contact. Well, it failed this test when I first tried it. Right up here at the front, it was absolutely touching the barrel on the bottom of the channel. So I spent about 30 minutes or so with just some sandpaper. I think it was like 160 grit, like emery cloth, and just kind of sanded all of the crap out of here. And I think it was mainly just taking off the last, uh, the last coat of, I don't know, whatever they cover this in as a final clear coat, where out here on the side, it's finished nicely. In there, it was extremely rough, and I think that was enough to take up the clearance. But she's good now, all the way back to the receiver. So crisis averted. The other thing I want to show you is with the magazine. So the magazine in this guy is snapping in and out a whole lot easier than it does on the compass. And the little D-shaped front magazine catch is a much tighter fit in this stock than it was in my 6.5 Creedmoor. So it just went together better and it just fits better. One thing I'll mention, both this gun and the compass, the magazine is loose in there. So I saw a video, somebody had put some tape on the side to kind of try and take up some of that slop because that could get annoying when you're out hunting and it's making noise on you. Another thing you'll see is I did remove the uh, sling studs just so it didn't interfere with my front bag. And same deal here on the rear. I went ahead and removed that guy. So enough of this crap. Let's see if this guy will actually shoot. So that's a pretty sweet stock, right? Especially with like it was snowing that day. That blaze laminate really just, it looks awesome. I thought it might be a little bit too flashy, but I'm, I'm digging the way it came out so far. I went a little bit cheap. Like whenever I was ordering it, I really wanted to get the adjustable comb, but that's an extra $60. And that feels like so much when the stock is only $160 to begin with. So that jump from, you know, 160 up to 220, it just feels like a big jump. But I decided against it in the end. And the way I justified it to myself is that it's the same stock I've got on the, the 6.5 Creedmoor. I've got the exact same scope rings. So cheek weld and everything, shooting position should be the same with the 300 Winchester Magnum and the 6.5 Creedmoor. So I think it's good. With, with those Weaver low rings I've got, it's actually pretty good. I don't really need the adjustable comb anyway, so I don't feel too bad about it. I did go with an upgraded uh, butt pad. I got the Limb Saver recoil pad, which was an additional 24 bucks, just to make shooting the 300 Winchester Magnum a little bit more comfortable. So that's variable number one, was the new stock. Now, since the last video, I've also picked up some new powders. 
The first is Vitivori N565. This is really a pretty slow option. I probably should have gone with N560, but I thought with the 220 and 240 grain bullets that the N565 might give us a little bit better velocity. I'm gonna get some N560 at some point and try it out, but we got some N565 to try here in upcoming videos. The next powder is Accurate Mag Pro. I just picked this up because I don't have any accurate or ramshot powders that are really appropriate for the 300 Winchester Magnum. I wanted to try just, you know, at least one of their powders. I decided to go with Mag Pro. This is a ball powder, and according to their load data, it shows, it shows some pretty uh, decent velocities. So future videos we'll be testing with Accurate Mag Pro. And the last is IMR8133. This is one of the Enduron powders in the IMR line. It's got, you know, copper fouling, removing additives. It's supposed to be insensitive to temperature. So I thought IMR8133 would be a good choice. Now, over on the Hodgton load data, IMR8133 is their very best velocity powder, especially for the heavier bullets. The next closest is Rotumbo. That's really what it came down to, the choice between 8133 and Rotumbo. I was gonna get one of those two and decided to go with 8133. Now there's another Enduron powder, IMR7977, which probably would have been the better choice. A little bit faster burning, but a little bit more versatile. We can shoot to some lighter bullets and the case fill's a little bit left. Here with IMR8133, we're mainly looking at max case fill, mostly compressed charges. So 7977 might've been the smarter choice. Now this is the powder I shot in that last terrible range trip. So that's variable number two. We had a brand new stock on the gun. We were shooting a brand new powder. So that's two new things I introduced. We're not even close to being done yet. So I also picked up some more bullets. I picked up two boxes of the 240 grain Sierra Match King. These are boxes of 50, so I got 100 of them. Our earlier test with this bullet was great. The 240 is a big, huge monster bullet. I'm looking forward to testing more with these in the future. So we've got more of them. But a lot of people were mentioning that, you know, with a, with a hunting rifle like the Thompson Center Compass, like why am I not shooting some hunting bullets? Why am I shooting, you know, 220 grain Sierra Match Kings and 240 grain Sierra Match Kings? Like pull out the hunting bullets, man. So I decided to pick up a few. The first is the 180 grain Nosler Partition. Now the Nosler Partition is legendary. Like this is the super tough, kill anything that craps, serious bullet. You can see here on this side, like this is a deer, elk, bear, moose, and African game. These are crazy expensive, but they've got a pretty unique construction. You can see like in the middle of the jacket, there's a part that goes all the way across. So there's like a base section that is totally protected from the front section where you get expansion. So this is all about weight retention. It's all about deep penetration. It's all about getting through the very toughest animals. So I'm looking forward to trying out the 180 grain nozzle partition. That's a big boy bullet for a big boy cartridge. Now I went with the 180s, there is a 200. And the decision on which one to go with came down to the next bullet that I picked up. That is the 200 grain nozzle AccuBond. So this is a bonded bullet from nozzle same sort of applications, deer, elk, bear, moose, African game, bonded bullet, so it's supposed to stick together, maximum weight retention, maximum penetration. So this is the 200 grainer. This also comes in a 180 and a 200. So these are also pretty darn expensive bullets. You'll see both of these boxes are 50, 50 count boxes and pretty pricey bullets, but I wanna give them a try and see how they shoot in our compass. Now, the last new bullet I picked up is the good old 200 grain Sierra Game King, right? Just the standard Game King. Now, what I was hoping for when I ordered these was that they would be similar to the 200 grain Sierra Match King in the fact that we can get close to the lands of our rifling while still fitting in the magazine, and they do. So at magazine length, we're, I think it was five or 10 thousandths off the lands. So we can get these guys really close. This is the bullet that I shot on that last range trip where the results were terrible. So, so far we've introduced a new stock, a new powder, and a new bullet all in the same video. Now, so far we've been shooting the CCI number 250, large rifle magnum primers. Our results have been pretty good so far. So the CCI 250 has been doing a decent job. Now in that last video, I did ask my wonderful audience what they suggested that I try for other primers. And it was nearly unanimous that I should try the GM 215M from Federal. This is the large magnum rifle match primer. 
the federal gold medal stuff. Like I mentioned, it seems to be an almost unanimous choice for a primer choice in the 300 Winchester Magnum. Now, I shot this primer in that last range trip. So a new stock, a new powder, a new bullet, and a new primer. And this is the target I ended up with. Just awful. Like the groups were just terrible. Bullets were spraying all over the place. So what in the hell am I supposed to blame it on? Like where do we go from there? Is the stock screwed up? Was one of the new components to blame? I don't know, I have no freaking clue. So today we're gonna to get a little bit closer to our comfort zone, you know, where we've had success and see if we can, you know, bring things back in line. Now on top of all the crap I've already talked about, I picked up three more types of factory ammunition because we're still on the hunt for some factory ammo that will shoot in this Thompson Center Compass. All of the ones we've tried so far have been pretty disappointing. Now the first one that a lot of people had recommended was the 190 grain Federal Gold Medal Match uses the 190 grain Sierra Match King. So I did shoot a group of these on that last range trip, but these were the last things I shot and I was getting really frustrated, but the first result was pretty promising. We're gonna shoot another group with these today and see how they do. I've got high hopes. The next one is some Hornady Superformance. This is the 180 grain SST. So we'll shoot this today. And the last one is some federal non-typical whitetail 180 grain soft point. So we've got a couple, couple types of factory ammo to test today. Now I also did some tests with some brass. This bag of Norma brass was sent to me by a viewer named Rick. Thank you very much, Rick. Now, I'm extremely happy to have this. Norma brass is not cheap, but Rick said he had nothing but problems. In his gun, every time he fires a shot, the bolt gets stuck. Like he's basically got to beat the crap out of the gun to get the round out of there. He said he's tried everything he can think, but this Norma brass just sticks on him. Every, you know, the other uh, brass brands he's tried are working fine. So I shot 10 rounds of this, of this Norma brass in the last video, and I had no problems whatsoever. Bolt lift was no problem, nothing sticking at all. So I only shot 10 rounds. So I've got 10 pieces that are once fired now. So today we're gonna to shoot 10 pieces of Norma and we're gonna shoot 25 pieces of the Hornady that we've already been shooting in the previous videos. So I'm at a loss. Like that's a problem I haven't run into before where a certain brand of brass is getting stuck in my chamber. So if you guys have any ideas for Rick or explanations for what he's seeing, please post down in the comments because I really have nothing to offer here as far as an explanation for what he's seeing. So we're gonna to continue to shoot them and we'll see if we run into any problems. So with our Hornady brass, if you remember, we bought a big old bag of them. So far, we're still on the, the first batch of 25, but we've got a bunch of them that are new still. So since I had 40 pieces of brand new Norma and I've still got plenty of Hornady, I decided to go ahead and compare them and I pulled out 40 random pieces of the Hornady and weighed them all. The results were pretty crazy. The Norma had a total weight spread of 1.9 grains. And there was one piece in particular that was about a half a grain lighter than all of the others. So if you took that one out, you'd be looking at under a 1.5 grain weight spread on the 40 examples I've got. That's pretty incredible. Especially when you think like these big huge cases are around 216 grains. So less than 1% of weight variation from case to case with the Norma. Really nice stuff. Now, the 40 pieces of Hornady that I grabbed had a 7.5 grain spread. We had several weird ones that were heavy, several weird ones that were low, and even kind of the main batch that were close to one another were still pretty spread out. Now, whether that actually makes a difference on target, I don't know. I'm not ready to say that it really does. I also measured their lengths, but both, both brands were very, very close on length. All of the Norma were within uh, six one thousandth of an inch, and the Hornady's were actually even better. It was within uh, four one thousandths of an inch. So length, they were all pretty consistent. Now the Hornady brass is significantly heavier than the Norma. I think I already mentioned the Norma was around 216 grains. Well, the Hornady is 233. So 16 or 17 grains of weight difference between the two brands. That seemed like a lot. After that last terrible range trip where everything went wrong, I at least I had some fired Norma I had some fired Hornady and also had some fired Federal from the Federal factory ammo. So I decided to compare their case capacities in grains of water, right? I filled them up full of water and weighed that. The Norma has the most case capacity. 
at about 95.4 grains of water was my measurement. The Hornady was 93.6 and the Federal was 91.3. That seemed like quite a bit, you know, from the least capacity with, with Federal up to the most capacity with Norma, almost a 5% difference, 4.5% difference. And between the two we're gonna be shooting today, Hornady and Norma is about a 2% difference. So we'll keep an eye on that. We'll see if the Norma gives us you know, perhaps a little bit higher velocity because it has less case capacity, or if it hits pressure signs sooner than Hornady, you know, it's something to keep our eye on. Now, one thing I've found hilarious are the people in the comments talking about Hornady brass. I've had lots and lots of comments saying that Hornady brass was terrible and that they switched to something different. Oftentimes Norma is what they say they switched to. I've been paying attention. I've read every comment. Nobody has mentioned what they found wrong with it. They just say it's terrible. They don't tell me whether it's primer pockets or they had case head separations or the neck split or the groups were terrible due to inconsistencies. No details whatsoever. So all of you guys who have complained about Hornady Brass, down in the comments, tell me what the hell you're talking about. Like, what should I be watching out for? Just telling me it's terrible isn't enough. Because listen, if it's terrible, I wanna find out that it's terrible and I wanna let everybody know that it's terrible. We'll dump it and move on to something else. But today is gonna to be our fourth firing on this brass and so far it seems to be holding up. Our groups have been pretty decent. So I, I just, I haven't personally found anything to complain about. So yeah, y'all ought to be ashamed of yourself. Give me some specifics. Now talking about the brass, I've been talking about wanting to neck turn this brass since the first video and we've never gotten around to it. So I wanna go ahead and do that today. Now, so far we've been using the Hornady match grade full size die. This is a bushing die that uses a bushing to size the neck. And we've got three different size bushings and all that stuff. Well, actually that may have been part of the last video. I got a third bushing. Yeah, that actually may have been part of the last video that I tried to film that you're never gonna see. But I got a, a, a third bushing. We've had the 333 and the 332 and we've been using the 332 and it's, you know, things have been okay. But I went ahead and picked up a 331 because if we turn some of the material off the neck and it gets a little bit smaller, we might need a slightly tighter bushing. So I got the 331, we may be switching it to it today. But what, what never dawned on me was that if I wanna neck turn this brass, I really need a standard full length sizing die. And I'll talk about why here in just a minute once we actually get to, to the neck turning. But what I decided to do was just go out and get a standard 300 Winchester Magnum Hornady custom grade full length sizing die. You know, just a normal sizing die, doesn't use bushings, uses that standard die neck and an expander. Well, what I found was that for the same price as just buying the full length sizing die, I could go ahead and just get a whole set. Like seriously, it was the same price. So now I've got a spare bullet seating die. I didn't really need one, but now I've got a spare. And here's our standard full length sizing die. And then this is our bushing die. So now I got a nice case to keep them all in. They don't normally all fit in one of these cases. I had to, there's a little post right here that you're supposed to use to keep your shell holder on. So I had to chop it off so I could fit the other sizing die in there. But it works out well. Now I've got a case for all of my 300 Win Mag dies and I don't have to have these floating around on me all the time. Like these, these uh, single die packages just end up making my bench a mess. So let's go ahead and get to neck sizing. This is my K&M neck turning set for 30, uh, for 30 caliber. I haven't used this in a couple years. Like it's been a couple years since I neck turned any brass. I think the last batch I did was some Lapua 308 brass. And it's been, it's been, it's probably been three years. So I might fumble through this a little bit. So the main pieces are the cutter. Like this is where the neck of your case goes over this and then the cutter is down in there. Now, as you'll see, this does not currently fit over this. What you have to do to make it so this fits over here is run it through a neck expander. I think we talked about this in the last video, perhaps. See, that's the other problem. Now I've gotten myself confused. I can't remember what I talked about in that last video that you're never gonna see and what I talked about before. But yeah, my notes say I did talk about this last time and we started using this with our bushing die. So this goes in our press, it just opens up the neck and it opens it up to the perfect diameter so that it'll fit nice and tight over this guy on our neck turning tool. Now I've also got this little like shell holder tool. You put a uh, kind of the standard Lee or Frankfurt Arsenal hand primer type of shell holders in there and this holds your case and this is what you use to 
turn it around on this guy while you're cutting. And that's really all there is to it. I mean, those are the pieces. So let's switch to an up close view because I wanna talk through why you need a standard fulling sizing die before you neck turn. So I've taken a piece of our cider brass and run it through our match grade fulling sizing die with the bushing, with the, uh, yeah, the 332 bushing. If I can get the light just right, you'll see that the bushing doesn't go all the way down to the neck shoulder junction. It's a little bit higher than that. So there's a portion just above that shoulder junction that doesn't get touched at all by our full length sizing die. So that, that portion is still the same size that it was when it came out of the chamber. Now our, our expanding mandrel, this mandrel is uh, 308, double check me here, eh, maybe 3085. Let's use the tip here, 3085, there's a 308. So this is the same diameter as our bullet. So if that lower portion of the neck was blown out to chamber size and our expanding mandrel is only 308, well, it's not gonna to touch down there. So if we take this piece of brass that I sized with a neck bushing and we run the, uh, we run the expanding mandrel through it, the upper, upper part will be consistent, but then there'll be a bulge at the bottom. And then if we neck turn, we're gonna be chopping off brass that we shouldn't be chopping off, right? Like right down here at the bottom, we're gonna be chopping off too much brass. So before any neck turning operation, we wanna make sure the entire length of the neck is sized exactly the same. And when the mandrel goes through, it's gonna expand the full length of the neck so that we can get an even neck turn all the way. Now this you know, shoulder neck junction here is a place that a lot of people obsess about. You'll, you'll sometimes hear people talking about the donut. And what that is is, so as you resize a piece of brass a bunch of times and you keep bumping back the shoulder, well, brass material that was once part of the shoulder will migrate up and become part of the neck. Because when our, when our brass case stretches, it stretches from down here. So this part is getting thinner every time that cartridge expands to fill up the chamber. It's not happening up here. So the idea with the donut is that the shoulder portion of the brass is thicker than the neck portion. And as it migrates up and becomes part of the neck, what you end up with is a thicker portion at the base of the neck than the rest of the neck. I think this is more of a problem with cartridges where you're seating bullets pretty shallow and bullets never even get down that far. Like, like my six PPC bench rest rifle, like all the bullet seating happens up here. Plus it's got a really long neck. So the bushing where, I mean, honestly, the bushing on this case almost makes it down, you know, all the way on the neck. But with that case, it's very obvious that, I mean, the bushing makes it maybe a little bit more than halfway down the neck. So you've got this portion there that can get kind of thick. And that's what, if you've ever seen inside neck reamers, that's what those are for, is you run it through a fulling sizing die, so the outside is sized properly, which means that that extra material should be pushed to the inside, and then you use an inside neck reamer to ream off that donut. I'm not sure why the hell I'm talking about this right now, because it doesn't really apply to us right now, and it's probably just confusing. And to be quite honest, a lot of people say it's not worth the trouble to get rid of a donut anyway, and that it doesn't freaking matter and you shouldn't even worry about it. But just kind of wanted to mention it. You know, if you're ever out there looking around about neck turning and, and you know, advanced brass prep techniques, I guess you might say, you might run into that inside neck reaming discussion or people talking about the donut. And I just wanted to mention it. So hopefully that explains why we need a standard fulling sizing die that's going to hit that entire neck so that we can expand the whole thing uniformly and get a nice consistent neck turn all the way from the mouth to the shoulder. So this piece that's been bushing sized is not ready for neck turning. However, here's a piece of our brass that we're actually going to be neck turning today. This is our Hornady that we've already fired three times. And I went ahead and resized these guys with the new Hornady die, just standard resizing. I bumped the shoulder, I think about two or three thousandths. And you'll notice there's no, there's no spot where like a bushing ended, like this entire neck got sized. You might also notice that I annealed these. I just used a torch. I was annealing for some other videos and happened to kind of have these guys ready. I'd already resized them. I thought, heck, why not? I'll go ahead and anneal them. I'm gonna have some more videos here coming in the coming weeks about annealing, but I figured here, you know, with three firings on this brass, an annealing couldn't hurt. Now, one thing I'll mention, so using the standard fulling sizing die on this brass, it stretched quite a lot. I trimmed all of these and took off quite a bit of material on all of them. So the standard fulling sizing die really kind of stretched these cases quite a bit 
and made it so that I had quite a bit to chop off. But they've been full length resized. They've been trimmed to length. I think I did a little bit of uh, deburr and chamfer on the case mouth and then I annealed them. So the next step is to run them through the expander. Now, one thing I'll mention about the expander here, I'll show you on the picture. You see how the expander's got this this uh, screw here, I, it's laying around here somewhere. I was trying to find it earlier. I don't know what the heck I did with it, but essentially there's a screw that screws into the bottom of the expanding mandrel. And what that's for is you screw it out so that the screw hits the bottom of the case before the mouth of the case hits the body of the expander. It keeps you from, you know, boogering up your case mouths here by hitting them against the uh, body of the mandrel. The problem is I, I had checked several weeks back, the screw that came with it isn't long enough to reach the base of a 300 Winchester Magnum case anyway. And to be honest, in the past, I never even used that screw anyhow. So we're not going to worry about it. So step one, let's get all this crap expanded. So this is pretty straightforward. We just put the expander in the die and screw it all the way down. I've been debating on whether or not to go ahead and neck turn the 10 pieces of Norma brass. And I think I'm going to, because if we neck turn them all the same, that should mean we'll need the same bushing in our match grade uh, full length sizing die, right? So I think we'll just go ahead and go for it. Now you want to liberally lube this guy. Yep, we'll throw a little bit on the mandrel right there. And then at least every couple cases, I'll go ahead and just little get a little bit inside of the case neck. And then we just raise, and then we just raise it up and bring it over the mandrel. So not much, yeah, not much to it there. I generally have to kind of guide it up there. And it does take a fair amount of force to get it up onto that dude. And then generally kind of have to pop the handle of the press a couple times to get it off of there. So I've got five pieces of our cider brass that we will use to set up our neck turning tool before we start messing with our 25 good pieces. So I'll run them all through this operation and we'll be ready to get down to business. I'll tell you what, before I let you go here, here's the first piece. Uh, that is has been annealed. This is the Norma. Actually, this is once fired as well. Wow, that went on there a whole lot easier and came off <laughs> extremely easy. I'll tell you what, let me use let me try a piece of the, the Hornady brass. Yep, that also went on there very easy and came off very easy. So hopefully annealing wasn't a bad idea here. Maybe it was. I don't know. We'll find out here in a minute. All right, so I'm really worried by the fact that the cases that weren't annealed, which is that row, went onto the mandrel a whole lot harder than the ones that have been annealed. So let's see if we got a different amounts of spring back. So about 0.335 is what I'm seeing here on a case that has been annealed. I'll spot check a couple of them here. 335, 335, that's pretty consistent. So let's look at the piece that was not annealed. 334, 333. Let's look at the next piece, 333. Okay, let's go back to an annealed case, 335. Well, crap. So the expander went through the annealed case and it didn't spring back in once it came out. The expander went through the hard case and it, and it uh, sprung back a little bit more. So if we set our neck turner up with this brass, I think we're gonna be cutting off more than we want on the pieces that have been annealed. I think it was probably pretty stupid to anneal them before this operation. Okay, change of plans. The pieces that haven't been annealed, we're not gonna mess with right now. So we'll just do the annealed ones. Maybe it was stupid to anneal these at all, at all before neck sizing. Maybe this was a completely inappropriate time to anneal. 0.336, this is Norma. Yep, that's a piece of our once fired Norma. Necks might be just a touch thicker on these, so that might account for the slightly larger diameter. There's another one that's 3, uh, 0.336. The next one's 0.336. Yep, I think they're probably just a little bit thicker. This isn't the best way to check neck thickness, but we'll do it anyway. So 14 and a half thousandths, turn the case a little bit. There's 14, turn it a little bit more, 13.5, 14.0. Okay, let's look at the next piece, 14, 14, 14.5. 14, and then let's look at the Hornady, 13, 13, 14. Let's go to the next piece. 13.5, 12, 12.5, 13.5. So yeah, I think the Hornady necks are just a little bit thinner than the Norma. Now I do have an RCBS mic, which is a better way to measure our neck thickness. This guy's a little bit screwed up. I think I need to re-zero it, which I think I can, I think you maybe loosen this up or something and I can adjust the zero. But right now you'll see that the number, it doesn't quite line up right with, uh, with zero. 
So measurements I take with this guy, I basically have to add one thousandth to the number. Let's see if the let's see if we get the same measurement here. What were these like? Fourteen, I think. And we're measuring exactly thirteen. All right, 10, 11, 12, 13, plus one is 14, so that's a 14. A little farther around the neck, just a little bit more than 14. A little bit farther around the neck, this one's a little bit less, like 13 and a half. So, you know, 12 and a half plus one. Let's look at a piece of Hornady. That one is 12 plus one is 13. So, yep, I think the Hornady is just a little bit thinner than the Norma. But I think we'll be able to use the same setting on our neck turning tool. We'll just be chopping off a little bit more on the Norma. Okay, so it's been through our expanding mandrel, so now it should slip over the pilot without much trouble. Yeah, there it goes. And we got a couple adjustments here. The first is the depth of this pilot, and we've got a set screw down in here. If we loosen this up, then our pilot should start moving freely. Yeah, there it is. See, it moves in and out now. And that little piece in there you'll see is the cutting blade. So what we need to do is put the case on the pilot down until the, the you know the case mouth stops on the end and then we need to we need to push it in until the cutter comes up to the right spot at the junction of the neck and the shoulder. Now you don't want to go too far, but cutting just the tiniest little bit into the shoulder or right up to the shoulder is what we're looking for. So let me go ahead and get the Allen wrench in this guy so that we're ready to tighten it up. There we go, it's still loose. And let's move this in to about right there. Yeah, let's, uh, let's tighten that down. We'll see how that goes. So there's tight, does that look good? We might've gone a little bit too far because I can feel, like as I'm trying to bottom out the case mouth, I can feel the cutter, I think, hitting the, the shoulder of the case just a touch, but that's fine. Like I said, we can chop into the shoulder just the tiniest little bit. I'll tell you what, I'll go ahead and turn it here and we'll probably see a shiny ring starting. Yep, and we are. Yeah, it might be just a touch too deep, but at least the first piece here, we'll go ahead and give it a try. So now next we need to set the depth of the cutter so that it comes down and hits our case. So the top of this tool has got these index marks. And I think the instructions said that's two thousandth of an inch. Oh, I'm sorry. It's two ten thousandths. <laughs> so each 30 degree uh, turn is basically 0.2 thousandths. So I guess what we can do, we, we're already pretty, now you can do coarse adjustments here. You, you loosen up, uh, I think you loosen up this and then you take this all the way out and you can make large coarse adjustments. This one's already pretty darn close and I'm not going to mess with it too much. Like I think we're close enough to where we can just make some fine adjustments until we start hitting that case neck. So the next thing here is I just want to kind of crank this guy down a little bit until I feel it start touching the neck of the case. It's pretty close. I'm feeling it get a little bit closer. Yeah, I think there we are. So I'm gonna go ahead and spin it on down the case and we'll see what it looks like. Yeah, and the more I'm messing with this, I think I've got it too deep. because you can see, it's already up to the shoulder and I've still got a little bit of a gap between my case mouth and the pilot. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and move this pilot up a little bit. Yep, so loosen this set screw and then maybe kind of squeeze these together and then bring it down here a little. Yeah, let's see if that seems, see if that seems any bit, any better. All right, yeah, now we're bottomed out. All right, so that's setting. Let's look at what happened to the neck of our case. Eh, we might be going just a touch too deep, but I, I don't think it's too bad. So it looks like we clearly chopped off a high spot there, but a good portion of the case we're not touching at all. So right now our adjustment index thingy is pointing about right there. So let's bring it over another two ten thousandths or about that, a little bit farther. Hopefully y'all can see what the heck I'm doing here. Just a touch more. All right, there we go. So now we're pointing at that adjustment notch right there. Okay, let's uh, let's run it back on there. I'm not even using, I've, I've, I got the shell holder and this crap, but we're taking off so little, I don't even need it. I'm just gonna spin it by hand here. So let's run it on there. That seemed to make absolutely no difference whatsoever. So let's go ahead and move up to the next adjustment. Eh, we're taking off the tiniest little bit, but still not much. Tell you what, let's, uh, let's make a pretty big move. Let's go to, yeah, two index spots there. And my battery's about to die in my camera. I need to go get a fresh one. All right, there we go. That feels like we're taking off a little bit more. Yeah, it's starting to drag pretty good on, clearly on one side. So let's have a closer look at this one. There we go. Now we're, we're nearly touching the whole one side, but the other side we're not. So we clearly had some uneven thickness, right? That side was a little bit thicker than this side. At the very least, that's what I'd like to get rid of today. I'd like to get them at least where our neck thickness is about even. So we're getting close. 
let me go get a fresh battery. All right, we got a fresh battery. And while I was doing that, I was able to get this up in the light and look a little bit closer. You guys have probably already been spotting it, but it's a little harder for me through the viewfinder, but I'm going a little bit too deep. Like I don't want to see that, that shelf at the base. Like we haven't ruined this piece of brass or anything. I think we're fine, but I just want to go a little bit less here with the depth. So let's loosen her up just a touch and we'll go just a little bit higher. Yeah, there we go. So maybe that won't cut quite as deeply into the shoulder. Tell you what, let's go ahead and move on to a second piece, which one thing I should have mentioned, you're always supposed to keep your pilot well lubed here so the case doesn't get stuck or gall. So yeah, let's see what this second piece looks like. Yeah, and I may need to start using the, the shell holder here. It's getting pretty tough to turn by hand. Yeah, let's do that. So it just goes in and you spin it till it's tight. Gives you a little something more to hold on to. And there we are at the bottom. And we'll spin it back out and have a look. Now this piece took material all the way around. Darken up the camera just a touch. Yes, yeah, so this piece took some all the way around, but it seems like we're thinner up at the case mouth and then thicker down here toward the bottom. We still got a little bit of a, we still got a little bit of a shelf there at the neck shoulder junction, but it's not too bad. I think it looks worse than it actually is because of the annealing, right? Like the drastic color difference between the annealed brass and the shiny stuff that's been cut. It makes that shelf look a little bit bigger than it is, but like that's, that's not bad. Or at least I don't think it is. And I, I'm no expert on neck turning folks. If I'm doing something stupid, feel free to let me know down in the comments, but I think we're getting there. I want to go just a little bit more. So let's go maybe one more index here, just a touch. So that's two more 10 thousandths. And let's go back to our first piece. I think this was the first piece. Nope, that's the second piece. Let's go back to the first piece and run this guy back through one more time and go ahead and chop some more off here. Just trying to move slowly in and slowly out. And now this is what we're looking, looking like. It hasn't touched right at the case mouth whatsoever, but we've definitely hit all the way around on most of the rest of the case. So let's, let's run the other one back through and see what this one looks like. Okay, there's that piece. It looks kind of similar, doesn't it? Where right at the case mouth seems to be our thinnest spot that our neck turning tool is just not hitting. So let's take a measurement and see how thin we've gone. 13.5, 13.0, 13.5, 14, 13.5, 13.0. Let's see if the RCBS micrometer agrees with us here. We're seeing about 12 plus one is 13. Next measurement, 12 plus one is 13. Next one, so it looks like uh, pretty consistent here at about 13. Yeah, I'm still worried that I went too far here into the, into the shoulder, but whatever, screw it. Listen, if we screw up this batch, hopefully it'll be a learning experience for us all. And we've got plenty of uh, new brass to play with. Here's a piece of the Norma. Let's see what the heck this does. Now, these were thicker, so I expect this to take off uh, quite a bit more material yeah, it immediately got stuck. Like you can see it's spinning the, well, it was a second ago. The shell holder was spinning, but the case wasn't. Yeah, there you go. Now it fell off. <laughs> okay, let's try it maybe a little bit tighter that time. Now the instructions from K&M tell you to, you know, it usually takes two passes to really get it the way you want it. So all the way on and all the way off. And then we'll go back through one more time and make sure we hit everything. Yeah, it looks like this case pretty much the entire surface got touched. So yeah, I guess that's good. Let's see what this guy looks like. Looks like it hit most of it, but there are still a few spots right around the case mouth that didn't get touched, but otherwise pretty much the whole neck got hit. So you know what? I think we're going to call this setting good. Well, let's, uh, let's take a measurement. These should be a little bit thinner than they were now. So 13.5, 13.5, 13.5. Five. So let's, let's go to the mic here and see what it tells us that's 13 plus 1 14 and eh, just shy of 14 and the next spot like 13 and a half same thing here on the next spot so i think we'll just call this good here's the next fresh piece of hornady a little bit of lube on the pilot and we'll run this guy through and of course my shell holder comes loose again hey, i probably need to use it's got a it's got a hole through it here somewhere yeah there it is right there that you can fit an Allen wrench through if I can find one small enough. Yeah, there's the hole. Stick that through there and use that as a little bit of leverage for tightening that guy down. There we go. Now it shouldn't slip on me. 
and all the way down on this guy and then slowly back it out and then one more pass through and then back out okay have a look at this guy and it looks like here on this side this was the thin side right we didn't even touch here on a couple spots but the rest of it got hit so that's the hope that as I run through all of these I don't get any pieces where we have like an entire side that didn't get touched that means I didn't quite have my neck turning tool cutting enough. So we really shouldn't be screwing anything up here, I wouldn't think. All we're doing is really evening out the thickness around the entire uh, circumference of the neck. And hopefully it'll, you know, lead to more consistent results as we use our bushing die. You know, our bushing fulling sizing die. I'm going to run this. Yeah, this is that same piece. Just running it back through one more time. Make sure those dull spots weren't just spots that I maybe didn't hit well enough. And doesn't look like they were, like they're still there. So I think that's about it here, folks, for, for neck turning. Like I mentioned, I'm no freaking expert. I don't do this very often. So any tips or tricks, or if you just want to call me a moron for doing something stupid, I would welcome all of those. So I'm going to take my time, run through all these pieces. Yeah, there's one side of this piece that isn't really touching very much. Tell you what, let me finish it up and I'll show you. Yeah, so this is kind of like what I was just talking about. Like that side got hit completely, but over here we had a thin side on this guy. A good portion of this did not get touched at all. So we just had a thin spot. Now you would think a piece like this that clearly had, you know, a thin side and a thick side, you'd think this would give us much more consistent neck tension. I don't know. We'll see if it makes any difference on paper, but it seems like it should. I'm not going to go any deeper. Like I'm not going to adjust the, uh, the neck turner anymore. We'll just call this good enough and see what happens. All right, so neck turning is complete and it is the following morning and just getting ready to get started again here this morning. I realized that my tired self last night was a moron. After I finished the neck turning, I took the time to wipe all of the lube off of the cases, but now I need to neck size them again or we'll run them through our full length bushing die, but we'll have it high enough so it doesn't bump the shoulder or anything like that. We're essentially just going to neck size them. So I should have done that before I wiped the lube off, but that's okay. We'll just use some dry neck lube this time. All of the Hornady cases ended up coming out the same way. There was one side that didn't really get touched and another side where a decent amount of material got taken off. So with this amount of neck turning, this shouldn't really have affected our sizing die bushing, right? Because all we've done is made them more consistent. We haven't reduced the minimum thickness at all, right? So maybe I should have gone a little bit farther, but here for the first pass, this seems okay. We'll see what the results are, whether we, I don't know, see any difference. We can always go back again and take off a little bit more material. Or maybe with the next batch, once we get through this first batch of 25 and move on to the next batch, maybe we'll, you know, do things a little bit different with those. I don't know. Now the Norma, yeah, so the Norma was clearly thicker. All of it got material taken off all the way around. So it should be pretty close or, you know, just a touch thicker than our Hornady brass at this point. And hopefully we can use the same bushing with this brass. If we were loading it without the neck turning, we probably would have needed a slightly larger bushing for the Norma to, you know, to achieve the same neck tension. That makes sense? So we haven't even talked about what we're going to shoot today. I want to go back to what's been working for us. The 220 grain Sierra Match King, the number 2240s. These have been good shooters for us. Now, up to this point, we've mostly been shooting Reloader 26. And when I bought those new powders that I showed earlier, I, had, I was actually going out looking for Reloader 26. I wanted to stock up, buy a couple pounds of Reloader 26 because it's clearly doing a good job here in 300 Winchester Magnum. It does a good job in 6.5 Creedmoor, but I can't find it anywhere right now. And powders go through cycles, right? Like they release a big batch and you can find it everywhere. And then after a while, it becomes very hard to find. And then the next batch gets released. I'm hoping that's what's going on with Reloader 26 and we can pick some up before too long, but I couldn't find it anywhere. So instead, I wanna shoot H1000 today. Like I have good confidence that this powder should shoot good groups with this bullet. We've shot a little bit of it in this series so far, but I don't think we've actually shot it with the 220 up to this point, but I'm pretty confident that it should give good results. So I found load data for this exact bullet with this powder on both the Hodgson website and the Sierra app. The new Sierra app has got a really nice selection of powders. They show, the Sierra shows a max charge of 74.5, but the Hodgton website shows 78.0. So pretty big difference. And actually the starting charge over at Hodgton is 73 grains, which is only 1.5 grains below the Sierra max. So because those two sources were so weird, I went out looking for some other information. The Hornady manual with their 220 grain bullets, they show a max of 75.3. 
and Nosler with their 220 grain bullets shows 75.5. So Hodgson's just higher than everybody else by three or four grains. So I don't wanna go that high to start out with. Let's go with the Sierra data. Let's go with the, the max they show, 74.5 grains. That'll be our max charge. And we'll do half grain increments, which has us starting at 72.5. We'll just see what happens. Now our 10 pieces of Norma brass, I wanna load those at 73.5 and 74. We're gonna stick with the overall length that's been working so well for us of right around 3.475, or more specifically, it's 2.9 inches exactly on my Hornady bullet comparator when measuring cartridge base to ogive. So 2.9 inch cartridge base to ogive, which is around a 3.475 inch overall length. I'm gonna go back to the CCI number 250 primers that we've been shooting in the last two videos I've released. We'll get to the federal primer in an upcoming video once we get our confidence back up after hopefully shooting some good groups today. I don't know. I'm anxious to see our range results today. So the next step, like I mentioned, I need to size the next on this brass. So let's head over to the press. All right, since I'm switching from greasy lubes to uh, dry lube here, I wanted to tear apart my dye and you know, wipe it down, get the gummy stuff out of there so it doesn't, so it doesn't mix with the dry lube here and make a gummed up mess. As I mentioned, we're sticking with the same bushing. This is a 332 bushing. We'll size them, we'll measure our neck tension, we'll see how it goes. So we've already proven with the expanding mandrel that this you know, freshly annealed brass is not springing back as much as the ones that, that weren't annealed. So that's gonna come into play here with our neck bushing as well. What we've been seeing in the previous videos is that we get about a thousandth of an inch of spring back. So like with our 332 bushing, they come out at about 333. So we'll keep an eye on that here today as well. All right, let's get the die in the press. So I've already got a lock and load bushing on this die from when I was using it earlier. So I need to pop out the one that's in there. Tell you what, these things are a freaking pain in the butt to get in and out. I wish they were a bit taller, had maybe some, you know, knurling or something around there you could get a hold of them. And I also hate the fact that they don't lock in. Like the Lee system has got a little indent and there's a spring-loaded pin in the top of the press. So you put it in and turn it and then the indent line lines up with the pin and it locks in place. These don't do that. And it makes setting up your die a little bit more difficult because like right now I need to loosen up this die and I need to, you know, break the lock ring free here. So at the start of that movement, it's the, the lock and load bushing turning before I can get any actual pressure on the die itself. So now the lock and load bushing is sitting there loose. I can't really get it tight. So I really kind of need to remove the whole die and then use my palm and then lock this guy all the way in and then start over with inserting my die. If the bushing locked in place, like on the Lee system, it would just, it, it makes life a whole lot easier. So I'm just gonna screw this guy down until it touches, and then I'm gonna back it out a fair amount. Eh, not quite a quarter of a turn, but it's definitely not making contact with the shell holder. So that should keep our shoulder from hitting the die. This brass has already been through a full length resize with the standard die, so I don't think the body's gonna touch much. So I'm just gonna dip this neck down here into some dry neck lube. This is the Redding Imperial dry neck lube stuff. So let's see what this gives us. Okay, that went in pretty easy. So I think we're in business. Let's see what, what neck diameter we're ending up with. It's like I'm still seeing 333. Remember this is a 332 bushing. So this is what we you know normally saw in previous videos. So the annealing doesn't seem to be messing us up here at all. So that's all there is to it here. I'll tell you what, so after this I need to prime and I need to weigh out my powder charges. And I'm sure this video is already getting ridiculously long, so I'll just skip over that. So I'll see you all right back here for bullet seating. Okay, so I changed my mind. There's a couple things I wanna mention. The Larry Willis uh, collet die that sizes the base right above the belt, all of these pieces were run through the Larry Willis collet die this time. Just wanted to mention that. Hopefully you remember about it from the previous videos. The other, this is the first opportunity I've had to use the Hornady hand priming tool with large primers. With small primers, I've been having problems where they like to get sideways and get flipped around in the tray, but I'm hoping it's gonna work a little bit smoother here with large primers. So I figured I would bring you along for the ride. That's a piece of Norma. Primer pocket feels great. Now my last range trip where everything kind of went wrong, I was shooting some extremely high velocities with IMR 8133 and the 200 grain Game King. So I'm on the lookout here 
especially with the Hornady brass that's been fired three times, I'm, I'm gonna be on the lookout for loose primer pockets. So at the end of this video, when we're reviewing our results for today, I'll also give you the information on velocity and stuff, you know, for those other rounds with IMR 8133. So you guys remind me to do that. There was the first piece of Hornady, it felt really good. Yep, so did the second. All right, so I'm down to the final five pieces here and haven't had any primer pockets that feel even a little bit loose. Like they're all feeling really, really good. Yep, perfect. And the Hornady tool worked a heck of a lot better and easier and smoother with the large primers than it does with the smalls. Interesting. All right, it is time for bullet seating. So let's get this bullet seating die set up. First we take a case, raise the ram all the way up, we're using our good old custom grade bullet seating die with the micro just micrometer adjuster cedar stem thingy up here. So we screw this down until we feel it touch the mouth of the case. And then we back it out about a turn and tighten down the lock ring. There we go. You notice the die sitting way up in this guy. I think 300 Winchester Magnum is really stretching things out on this press, right? There's plenty of room to get the case in and out and all that crap. And it certainly fits, but this die sure is way up there. All right, so we need to dial in 2.9 inches cartridge base to ogive. So yeah, let's back this out here. Yeah, and once we set the bullet on there, that kind of illustrates it even more. Like, like it just barely fits in this press. You almost kind of got to go in bullet first because you can see going in base first, the tip of the bullet actually hits the, the top of the press. So let's start dialing. And the first one here, we're at 2.984. So let's go ahead and go down yeah, let's go down 80. So there's 50, 60, 70, and 80. Let's see where that puts us. And it moved just as much as it should have, 2.904. So we're four thousandths too long. Let's go ahead and see the second one and see if we get the same number. Yep, perfect, 2.904. So let's go ahead and go down four. There we go, that's about it right there. Reseat that guy. Go back to the first one and reseat it. And then we'll go ahead and seat a third just to be sure. And let's see what these guys read. 2.900. Second one here, like half a thousandth short, 2.8995. And the third one here is 2.9. So that was easy. Let's double check our overall length. 3.470. Oh, well, that's a short one. 3.464 and 3.467. I do have several boxes of these 220 grain Sierra Match Kings. So we might've just grabbed a different box and it's given us a little bit shorter overall length, which is not something I'm concerned about at all. That cartridge based ogive number, which is right at 2.9 is the much more important number. Yeah, but then again, I may have just got some short bullets there on the first one, the first couple, like here's, here's one that's uh, 3.473. And I think 3.475 is the number I had written down. Yeah, the next one, 3.466. And this batch does seem to have particularly ragged tips here. Like they've got little, yeah, they're just not very uniform at the tip. So absolutely nothing to worry about whatsoever. Now, if we have a look at our neck tension, like I was mentioning earlier, the necks came out of the die right about 0.333. And when I measure one with the bullet seated, I'm getting, uh, eh, let me get it back there either 0.334 or I'm seeing a lot of 0.3345. So about one thousandth or 1 1.5 thousandths of neck tension. Now in one of our future videos, we really need to explore this a little bit, you know, compare, use the different bushings and compare some groups and velocities and standard deviation numbers and stuff like that when we use the different die bushings. I went ahead and jumped to the max charge and we're still getting the same cartridge based ogive number of right at 2.9 and I still feel a little bit of powder moving. So with H1000, it's not a compressed charge. So we should be able to seat all of these on the same die setting. So before we head out to the range, let's look at the Norma brass and its neck tension. I can already tell just by feel that it's got a little bit more, so a little bit more resistance there during the seating operation. Cartridge based ogive number is the same, just a hair over 2.9 inches. And before seating, we get the same number that we did with the other, 0.333. And after seating, I'm getting 0.335 or 0.3345. So 
So these are one and a half to two thousandths of neck tension. So just a tiny little bit more than the Hornady brass. So if I wanted to even these out, what I would need to do is turn the necks down just a little bit more to match the Hornady's a little bit better. All right, folks, I think that's pretty much it. So let's go ahead and head out to the range. Okay, folks, it's time to get started. I've got a target at 100 yards. It's got one inch dots on it. Our gun is a Thompson Center Compass. It has a 24 inch barrel with a one in 10 twist. I'm shooting with my Silencer Co. Omega Suppressor here. And as you might notice, we've got a big uh, lab radar chronograph set up to get, gather our velocity. The scope is a six to 24 power Vortex Viper PST Gen 1. So I wanna start out with uh, some factory ammo. The first one we're gonna shoot is the Federal Non-Typical. I have shot a couple rounds through the gun here with this ammo to double check my zero and get it warmed up. So hopefully we'll be close. Let's get started. All right, so that group is not terrible, especially for uh, some inexpensive, you know, hunting ammo. 2,908 feet per second. The box says we should have expected 2,960. So that's pretty close. So we're about 50, 50 feet per second off the box velocity. A great standard deviation of 9.6 and an extreme spread of 22. It's all good. We've seen a lot worse. So next, I wanna shoot the Hornady Superformance. This is the 180 grain SST. So let's see if these guys will group. Now, the velocity on the box with these is 3,130 feet per second. So these are smoking fast. We'll see if they'll group. So that one shot that dropped low kind of ruined our group here with Hornady Superformance, but still not uh, terrible, I guess. Velocity average was 3,113 feet per second. What I say the box was? Yeah, the, the box says 3,130. So we're just barely under the box velocity with Superformance. So there's one more factory ammo to try out here, and that is the 190 grain Federal Gold Medal Match. I had a lot of people tell me to try this stuff and they predicted it would shoot well in the compass. So let's find out if they're right. Okay, so that's not too bad. Let's see what the box velocity on this was. Uh, yeah, it says 2,900 feet per second and our average was 2,927. So we were a little bit higher than the box velocity. That 20.5 feet per second standard deviation isn't the greatest thing we've ever seen in the world, but the group was pretty good. So with the exception of that one shot with the Hornady Superformance that went really low, that wasn't some terrible shooting for some factory ammo. Now the expectations are about to raise because we are switching over to our hand loads with the 220 grain Sierra Match King. Our first load is 72.5 grains of H1000. Let's see if these guys will group.
All right, that shot didn't go off. Looks like a light primer strike. Huh. We'll go to the next round and then we'll, we'll circle back to that one and shoot it again. Yeah, this is the light primer strike load. Let's let's smack it again, see if it goes off. Yeah, there it went. Huh, that's weird. Not sure what the heck was going on there. So that was a pretty decent group. Like, yeah, not too bad. Velocity 2712, nice and low. If we're to believe the Sierra and Hodgson data, we should be maxing out at around 2,800 feet per second today. So we'll see how that goes. All right, the next load is 73.0 grains. Let's see if it groups. Man, the mirage today is just terrible. Like my dot down there is dancing around. As you can tell, extremely bright sun today. And the mirage is just pretty severe. All right, so that group kind of went to crap. Velocity up to 2740, 11.0 standard deviation. Little bit disappointed in that group though. So we're halfway done, 25 shots down, 25 left to go. So it's time for me to take a little break, let the gun cool off a bit. All right, so I've had a little bit of a break and I'm feeling rejuvenated. Disappointing results so far, right? Those first five groups were not awesome. So let's change that. Next up is 73.5 grains in the Hornady brass. Now this load, we're gonna shoot it in the Hornady brass and then the Norma brass. First up is the Hornady brass. Let's see how it shoots. Okay, there's another misfire. We haven't had any problems like this whatsoever. So the only thing I've changed as far as priming goes is using the Hornady priming tool. Maybe the, maybe the primers didn't get seated quite deep enough or something, I don't know. That's weird, that's really, really weird. Okay, back to the round that had the misfire, the light primer strike. Let's hit it again, see if it goes off. Yep, there it went. Interesting. All right, so next I wanna shoot that exact same load with Norma brass, and we'll be on the lookout for any bolt sticking problems or anything like that that Rick saw. Okay, for some reason, the chronograph read 5,721 feet per second on that shot. I'm thinking that was an error because at 25 uh, yards, this lab radar chronograph tracks the bullet as it goes down range. So at 25 yards, it was 2,704 feet per second. So yeah, I think it just went a little bit, a little bit goofy on us there. All right, that's a good looking group. All right, so if I delete that one 
goofy velocity, I ended up with an average of 27.13 and 8.5 feet per second standard deviation. And definitely our best group of the day. Good stuff. Okay, back to Hornady brass. We're moving up to 74.0 grains. Let's shoot another good group. I like, I like good groups. Let's do that again. So our group opened back up there a little bit. That's not good. So next up is that same load, 74.0 uh, grains, but this time in Norma Brass. Let's see if the Norma Brass can shoot another good group. All right, once again, we're a little bit low on velocity when compared to the Hornady Brass. The group was pretty decent, like it was better than the Hornady group. So we've got five more shots to go here. Our last load is 74.5 grains. Let's see how this one does. Okay, so velocity wise, we made it up to 2783, just a touch shy of the 2800 feet per second estimate from the Sierra data. Little bit disappointed in the groups today, but let's get packed up, let's get back to the bench. Okay, so let's have a look at today's brass. This was our max charge with the Hornady brass. Case heads look great. We get a little bit of primer cratering like we've become accustomed to here with this gun and also my 6.5 Creedmoor compass does the same thing but otherwise the case heads look great. Nothing weird going on with the necks, you know, related to our neck turning effort. It doesn't seem to have uh, screwed anything up at the very least. And it's the same story over here with our Norma brass. No marks on the case head. They're all just looking good. This second firing has gone just great with the Norma brass. And our turn necks seem to have held up just fine. Just not much going on here with the brass. Okay, next let's have a look at the groups. And I kind of wish we could skip this part because they're not looking pretty. We really only shot one good group today. The second one on the bottom row, the Norma Brass, 73.5 grains of H1000 was a 0.536 inch group, but I think it was just a fluke. The other group with Norma, the next to last one on the bottom row was a 1.322. So it's gonna take more testing to evaluate this Hornady versus Norma thing. I will say, so the Norma, the two groups with Norma, those were our two best standard deviations with our reloads today. Not by much, but you know, at least by a little. So that one group, that was our only group under an inch. Most of them hovered in that inch to inch and a half range, except for a couple bad ones there. The, the second group with the 180 uh, grain Hornady factory ammo had that one shot that went really low, but the 190 grain gold medal match, that was a 1.199 inches, that compared really well with most of the other groups we shot, but just overall very disappointing. One more thing to mention here on the target. So in our Hornady versus Norma test as well, the velocities, we got lower velocity with Norma by, let's see, was that 27 and around 40, so 30 or 40 feet per second slower out of the Norma, but the Norma has more case capacity, so that's what we were expecting. Now, one thing I mentioned earlier in the video is that I would uh, give you the velocities 
from my last range trip with IMR8133. I was shooting the 200 grain Sierra Game King. So just kind of using these as a comparison, like our three types of factory ammo, the 190 grain gold metal match was at 2,927 feet per second. And that 180 grain Superformance was 3,113 feet per second. Well, these are the numbers I saw with IMR8133. You can see that 200 grain bullet, we almost got it to 3,000 feet per second, 2,954. Now the group sucked, so we definitely need more testing before we find out if this you know, high velocity is usable, but getting a 200 grainer right up almost to 3,000 feet per second is pretty smoking fast. So that's that. So what's going on? I mean, I guess is the main thing we've got to answer. I, I can't help but think that today's load with H1000, even though we hadn't shot this powder and bullet combination, I feel like H1000 should have shot some good groups. So what that brings me back to is the stock. I think the stock swap has caused some accuracy problems. Now I did something pretty stupid. I gave away my original stock. I had posted some pictures over on Instagram of, of the new stock. Somebody sent me a message saying, hey man, will you sell me your old one? And I just gave it away. I'm glad to have done that, but now that I'm questioning the new stock, it'd be nice to have it so I could just slap it back together. We could do another range test and see if that makes a difference, but no big deal. We need to fix this stock, right? We've spent the money on the stock upgrade. We need to get it working well. So the next step is to bed the action into the stock. So glass bedding is not something I've ever done before on any of my guns. So I've got a lot of research and investigation to do to find out how to do it right. So I think that's my next move here in 300 Win Mag. So the other thing that's got me worried are the two rounds that didn't go off the first time today, the light primer strikes. When I was seeding those with the, with the Hornady hand priming tool, they felt like they were going in well, like they felt like they were fully seeding. So I'm not sure what the heck to think there. We'll have to keep our eye on that. The Norma Brass did fine. Didn't have any extraction issues or pressure problems of any sort. So, so far so good on that front, but I just don't have anything or any advice to offer Rick to explain why it didn't work well in his gun. Once again, I would invite any of you guys who have ideas, post them down in the comments. I'd love to understand why a particular brand of brass might, uh, you know, stick in his chamber. It's a pretty weird problem. So I think that's it folks. Pretty darn disappointing. I can't say we learned all that much, but hopefully we narrowed it down to a stock issue. Another thing I'll mention, be sure to check out the video posted by Bolt Action Reloading. He used the, uh, the Tubbs Final Finish kit in his 300 Winchester Magnum Compass. I get asked about that Tubbs Final Finish all the time. They're like bullets with abrasives and different levels of abrasion and you shoot them through the gun and it's supposed to basically kind of polish your, your barrel. And he does a really nice job of walking through the process and pictures of his rifling and all that stuff. So be sure to check that out. I'll add a link here at the end of this video. So it's easy for you to find. So that's where we'll leave this one, folks. I'll see you guys next time.